opportunity to hear again from our experts. Now may I invite uh, Professor John Haskett. He's the Acting Dean of the School of Design of the Polytechnic University. He's going to share his insights on how Hong Kong can become more creative because he actually has consulted a lot of government worldwide. He has a lot of experience in this area. And then I would also like to invite uh, three experts uh, back to the stage as respondents. Uh, first of all, uh, let me invite Mr. John Hawkins, and then Professor Jeffrey Krosik, and Professor Edmund Cold. And then our facilitator for this session is Edmund, is the Anthony Hong Kong Design Center G uh, Executive Director. So over to you, Edmund. Whoa, the, the lights is uh, shining. Wow, um, thank you very much, Rachel. I think um, I was thinking about, you know, to, um, the way, you know, to kick start, you know, having Rachel throw sweets at you, you know, to keep you awake. But obviously, after this sandbox, uh, uh, sandbox um, workshop, and I'm sure that uh, everyone is still pretty much alive. Now, um, our forum today is about, you know, this creative uh, prosperity, creating prosperity. And I think, you know, to, um, what we literally gone through the process before is very interesting. You know, our vision, success, the actions to be taken, and you know, to, um, and some of our dreams that you know, we want to take on. So cherish those things in your mind, because I think you know, John is going to tell you something. Hopefully, you know, um, um, we'll be able to create a bit more interesting dialogue um, afterwards. Um, there you go, John. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm going to talk about uh, a more differentiated approach to creativity than I think has been generally the case. I've worked in design for, uh, in higher education for 44 years. And after that long period of time, I've got rather weary of the way design is still presented in some quarters as being something that is trivial, decorative, and of little value. So what I want to try and do is to talk about my experience in design and to try and point up some differences in the approaches to creativity that I think are important in understanding it. First of all, if we talk about design, we have to acknowledge the fact that we're talking about economic value. The vast majority of designers work in business or commercial contexts. I'll put the figure as high as 90%, though I have no research validation for that guess. But what links any commercial business of any kind is the need to generate economic value, in other words, profit. And it's a law of business life. No profit, no survival. And it follows from that that if the overwhelming majority of design work takes place in a business context, in any business, design must be judged by its success in innovation and competitiveness. And the corollary of that is that designers need to function as business professionals, not second-class artists, which is often the case. And it's still a problem for us. We still get students applying uh, for our courses, thinking that design is a form of art and it's going to be fun. And we have to disillusion them pretty fast and tell them that life is not that easy. It can be very tough. There's a large element of discipline re re required in studying design. There's a large amount of commitment that's required. And it, it isn't something that's an easy option. It's a highly demanding, critical option. If we talk about design as art, I've got a, an interesting example that I picked up some years ago from the New York Times Sunday Magazine when I was working in the States. They commissioned 10 designers, but in actual fact they were craftspeople and artists for the most part to choose an object of everyday life and to redesign it. This was the work of a ceramic artist called Jonathan Adler, who lives in New York. 
he chose the toilet. And you may notice that down in the bottom right hand corner there's some text explaining his design. I chose to redesign a toilet, he says, because even though everybody has one, they're always so dreary. I wanted to create a cheerful toilet. I was inspired by Dior's new look with its wasp-waisted silhouettes from the 40s and 50s. The shape makes it a little cuter. The graphic element makes it fun. There are a number of functional issues that it would need to be addressed for this to actually work but the toilet really is the perfect arena for playfulness. Well, it depends on what turns you on. But according to this ceramic artist, the criteria that he's talking about are cheerfulness, cuteness, fun, playfulness. I wonder what would happen if you offered his concept to a manufacturer of bathroom wear. One of the most successful companies in that field in the world is Toto. And they go beyond this limited approach to design as art. They've totally revolutionized toilets and their use in Japan. Toto is the best known brand name in Japan, which is an indicator of the success they've had. This is not a very clear photograph, but you can maybe see that there's the electronic controls uh, on the left hand side and look at the top of the water tank. Japanese bathrooms of course are often very very small. They don't have room for a sink to wash your hands after use so they've got a tiny little sink in the top of the water system with a little tap that you can maybe see. And I've visited Toto and I've talked to their designers and marketers and it's clear that they take their job very, very seriously. And there's a large amount of data that's involved in uh, designing their work. And what you get is a much more complicated uh, vision of how they work. On the left-hand side, there's still those aesthetic formal factors. But to that is added <coughs> function, manufacturing, and marketing with various kinds of design tools required to bring the project to fruition. Now I could do a similar diagram <coughs> for other aspects of design such as visual communication, uh, interior, des interior design, transportation design, but they would all have a similar kind of complexity. This is just an indication of the kind of range of things that are actually needed in design work. And the main task that is probably thought of as being required of designers is to generate product value, a differentiated visual image. But this function is very superficial and it's short term for the most part without any long term competitive perspective. And in some product sectors, form is no longer the determinant of value. I visited Korea last week. Um, spoke to the chief designer of LG the, with Samsung, the, one of the two big electronic firms in, in Korea. And the chief designer, the vice president for design, told me that they're very worried in, at LG because no longer is it possible for them to, complete, to, to create complete designs. If you think of uh, all the aspects of a, of a cell phone. You're not buying an object for its looks, for its form. You're buying it as a vehicle for a whole series of uh, applications and platform and standards. And they, in fact, are the purpose for buying it to get access to that kind of information. It's not, the form is just a container. It can be very, very simple in actual fact. It can be capable of containing a very complex range of, of loaded applications. This differentiation is shown by uh, some objects from a friend's collection of lemon squeezers. It's amazing that this ch task of taking a lemon, cutting it in half and squeezing it has, has evoked so many forms. They range in price from very, very cheap. These little, in the top, uh, right, the uh, 
squeezes there in glass and plastic would probably be very inexpensive. Then, of course, you get Philippe Stark's uh, very, very well-known piece, Juicy Salaf, he calls it. Uh, that costs about, when I was in the States, that cost about 90 US dollars. And they produced one that was gold-plated uh, for $200 for some anniversary or other. Um, if you look at that, it's got a glass there with juice and the words fresh, 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 in which I've added lies, lies, lies. <laughs> For the simple reason that that juice in that glass did not come from that, that damn orange. <laughs> in other words, the thing does not work, and the two hundred gold plate, the two hundred dollar gold plated version, adds a certificate guaranteeing it will not work. It's a decorative item. It's a it's a fun piece, and it brings in a nice income for the manufacturers and the designers. But the diversity there, in that simple object, is amazing. And find many, many more to add to the, 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 the range. <coughs> Basically, when one talks about design in terms of product value, you can't talk of creativity in one particular level. Uh, there's a fundamental level of innovation that creates totally new value and is an original creation, but there are also enhanced functions, added features, and the adaptation of other people's ideas, i.e. copying. Process value is another key area. Design is about change, but change like profit is not an end in itself. It has to be justified as a means by its content. Value derived from design through increased market share, uh, cultural appeal in global markets and brand building are important rather than lower costs. But again, a variety and diversity of means are available to achieve those ends. Support functions are important. Uh, I'll skip some of these, this text. I don't want to just read it through. Uh, Pre-production concerns. Sourcing materials assuring the feasibility of manufacture are important. Critical changes before manufacture avoid reducing the need for change orders. Quick case study, I've got two quick ones that I'll just show you to em emphasize the, the diversity of approaches that are required in design. This is a company in Guangzhou that uh, is a highly successful startup from about 13 years ago. It was founded by an industrial designer. It's interesting that designers as entrepreneurs are important. Uh, they started emphasizing industrial design, then they found marketing was important, then they found distribution and logistics were necessary as emphases. King Long, the largest coach and bus manufacturer in China, a design firm called Nova were asked to uh, redesign their range and they came up with the problem in that on the left hand side you can see a diagram in two parts. The, the early stage is design, it's then handed over to engineering in the second stage. And what the designers do are just renderings of uh, copies of what everybody else is doing with slight variations. What the design firm did was not just to bring the two together but to extend the parallel tracks for both and to get them working together they provided a common computer platform so that engineers and designers worked in the same software and could exchange ideas and configurations very, very easily. That kind of management expertise in managing creativity, I think, is a crucial aspect. I'm going to just show you a quick diagram. From concept to market launch on this base, over time, two things on the vertical axis, decision changes and costs, from low to high. Basically what happens in any development process is you start with a clean sheet. And as soon as discussion starts, you start thinking about possibilities. You start eventually to make decisions. And when you take decisions, that leads to more decisions until 
the, 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 the scope for possible change closes in. It becomes too time-wasting or too costly. And you reach a point down at the base where it evens out into what, what some people call this the, the plateau of stability, where it becomes highly expensive to change anything at all. So you start from a high possibility of decision change, things are open, down to low possibilities of decision change. Cost, on the other hand, starts very low and rises very quickly. So that by the time you get to the process of, um, of ramping up for production, your costs are very high, the, 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 the potential costs and the actual costs are both substantial. What does that mean? Very, very simply, you make the maximum changes possible in the earliest stage where the cost is minimum. And by the time you get down to ramping up for production, you want the minimum change because uh, it's going to cost you a, a lot. Change orders in some companies represent 10% of the total budget for any project development. Just changing things costs you 10%. And eliminating that is, is vitally important. So avoid changes there, get decisions right up front. And that means also that we're talking about creativity, vision, copious ideas, change, inspiration up front. But implementation requires methodology, focused ideas, established knowledge, research in depth. Strategic value, uh, working together with people is, is, is crucial for designers who have probably the broadest range of contacts of anyone in a company. Uh, innovation is easier when people cooperate. Time's closing in, so I'll skip some of this. The strategic level is really important and needs further discussion, but uh, I, I don't have time, I'm afraid. McKinsey, leading management consultant work, include product design in their chain of value. What they don't mention is very curious. What they don't mention is users. When you're faced with a, a, a difference of producer-centered approaches and user-centered approaches, within design, user-centeredness becoming a very important factor. Building user scenarios, again, are important as a means of uh, evaluating existing products and, and, and deciding on others. Another network that I've used to try and show how design links up with all sorts of other factors. Uh, perception is shaped by communication in the market, mainly advertising, and design and the user are linked in the concept of the interface. Some people say to me, well, I can understand brand being linked, but what about finance? Um, three years ago, I visited Samsung in Korea, and the vice president for design there told me that when the chief uh, executive of Samsung went to merchant bankers to negotiate huge loans for the future expansion and development of his company, he would not only take along Samsung's financial experts, as you would expect, he took along a team of designers. And you might wonder, what on earth are they doing in that context? Well, the quick answer is, they were expected to provide scenarios of Samsung's future product development and ideas uh, for designs that were supposed to inform and inspire the merchant bankers to have confidence in the future development of Samsung. It's very interesting, somewhat unusual role for designers, but it does show that the scope, in fact, of, of designs, relationships, and networks is very considerable. User value is crucial in all this. And again, I'm, I'm skipping that stuff. Um, in terms of creating value, this is a variant of, of what people were saying this morning about the future uh, being created. Markets do not exist, they're created. When Sony brought out the Walkman, nobody in their right mind would have said they wanted a, a small tape recorder that didn't record. But that's what they got, and it sold in millions. Uh, Steve Jobs with uh, his iPod pulled a similar trick of creating an incredible market. Brand values. This is a beautiful piece of creative work. 
But are we really talking of friends of the earth when we talk of BP, given all the stuff in the Gulf that they spilled? You can, pr you can provide a very good product and service without a flashy logo. These are very simple logos, but you get good service from those companies. Social values. This is one of my favorite social value slides. Vienna tramways. Porsche design, who mainly do luxury design, but did some very excellent transportation design here. Designed these trams with a floor that is about two inches above road level. So that when they come into the bus, stop, to the tram stop, the pavement is at exactly the same height as that floor. And it's very, very close in, in width. So that when the tram doors open, anybody with a pram or a wheelchair can go just straight over the tiny little gap between floor and pavement. And when they come on, they can just sort of get on in the same way and find spaces inside. As you can see from the right hand side, uh, there's open spaces there. Cultural value. British Telecom was a privatized company that took over Britain's telephone services. And they threw out the old red telephone box and it caused enormous problems. The British Telecom, I think for many years, was the most hated company in the UK for what it did in removing those telephone boxes. You, you, you can't mess with people's cultural preferences and, and feelings. Uh, there's, again, there's a big story behind that, but I, I'll leave it. Culture takes some very strange forms. The guy, the guy on the right, was an developed an enthusiasm for Baroque architecture and design. When he resigned, he trained himself as a cabinet maker, and this is his uh, terraced house in Blackpool in Lancashire, Northern England. It's quite an amazing piece of work. He did every bit himself. Uh, taste is often bizarre. Creativity can similarly take very strange forms, and there's nothing wrong with that part of the diversity of human nature. Politics, the Danish government has got a marvelous range of state identity symbols. Uh, Bo Linneman, a very well-known Danish visual designer. And here we have, somebody mentioned, uh, I think it was, uh, who was it that mentioned uh, tax forms? Right, here's the Hong Kong tax form. How about improving people's lives by redesigning that and getting a good information designer to give enough space for the answers that are required or to use on a computer? It's not a very good, it's not a very user-friendly form. So what I've tried to do is to just rush through various ways in which design creates design, various ways in which designers are creative. Um, and I think we need to grasp all these differences in order that design and other activities can be properly managed if we subsume everything under one general heading of creativity. I don't think we're going to have a lot of success in micromanaging activities in companies that are trying, in fact, to develop creative activities in their employees. Five minutes up. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Okay. Thank you very much, John. I think I think um, this talk probably, you know, it's, um, and obviously, you know, from from what we've been talking about creating prosperity, prosperity, I think, doesn't just embrace um, health and wealth. I think it also reflects a state of mind as well, and how you create that value, you know, the, um, gen uh, creating wealth, and what John proposes, you know, to tap into the design thinking and how to utilize. Uh, designed strategically to create value. Now, but um, going back, you know, to this topic, creativity, and now this morning, I kind of broadly utilize a term called the creative leak, you know, as the kind of like the vision of getting us prepared to be the persons with the resourcefulness and skill sets um, for uh, the challenges ahead. Now, we have a great panel of, of people here, you know, um, um, and perhaps, you know, I would like, you know, to hear, you know, maybe from, from yourself, you know, Tom, we are, we are n now in a state, you know, Hong Kong, I think, is more than just um, 
um, um, asking are we ready for the creative economy. I think with the presentation that we go through this morning, I think we have you know, the foundation, we have the fabrics, we have the developments and we have the education going. There are things that we can improve, there are things that we can enhance. So how we could take us to a higher level at the individual level, organizational level, or society level. And I think that's the challenge that we need to, to ask. Now, John, you know, it's, um, um, <clears throat> I read the book, you know, your, your, your books on the creative economy. I think you published that um, in 2002. And then in 2010, and then you published another book on creative ecologies, okay? Now, naturally, I, I wonder, you know, to, with yourself tracing, you know, the creative economy throughout the years, what would be your vision, you know, in the years ahead, if you're writing the next book or, or, or preparing the next one, you know, um, what, have, what have you got in your, in your mind? What, what I have in my mind is a, is a conference where I'm sitting there and, I'm, I'm, and, and you're asking questions. <laughs> That's what I have in my mind. The, when I wrote The Creative Economy 10 years ago, the focus was very much on a specific set of industries that were given the name, the label, creative industries. And when I wrote Creative Ecologies, I was stepping back from that and looking at populations. I, that's, that has a specific sense in the field of biology and ecology, a, a population that in which every member of the population inhabits um, a niche where they function in a particular way. And that was partly a response to my feeling that the focus on creative industries was misguided and partly my awareness that the internet and the web were generating a huge amount of creativity without any commercial element to it. And I wanted to see how individuals functioned, um, small groups, large groups, where they felt confident enough, happy to enjoy their creativity. Um, there's there's a, a wonderful man, one of my heroes, called Suchka Moko, who is an Indonesian educator and diplomat. And he had a marvelous phrase, which was the learning capacity of a nation. The learning capacity of a nation. And he was thinking in terms of um, national development in the 60s and 70s. And he said the learning capacity of a nation it's more important than money, finance, technology, trade. The most important factor is the learning capacity of the population. Will they learn? Can they learn? And I think that concept can be applied to any population. It can be applied to a family. It can be applied to a company. It can be applied to a school, a university. It can be applied to a neighborhood can be applied to a city, perhaps, even perhaps a whole country. And I'm interested in populations that can learn and then, having learnt, can adapt their behaviour. And the groups, populations that will succeed, I think, in the 21st century are the ones that have the capacity to learn and have the capacity, the freedom, to be able to adapt and change their behavior. They can learn from anywhere. They can learn from schools, from universities. They can learn from the, each other, from their friends. They can learn from their enemies. They can learn through physical meetings. They can learn online. The internet is the biggest learning machine this planet has ever had. It's, it's completely wonderful. So I'm interested in creativity and, and learning and change and adaptation of people in social groups. 
And I, and I think what's, what's, what's interesting in places like Hong Kong, and it's really good being small. It's, it, you have a great advantage being small. <laughs> it, you, you, have, you have the ability to change quickly being small. Um, the interesting thing about Hong Kong is its evident desire, which I've noticed over the last 10 years, in wanting to change. And yet, as someone said this morning, Hong Kong is in a state of continual change, almost volatile change, but always seems to be in the same place. It seems to be running very fast to keep still. Um, but I've also noticed, and I'll just conclude with this final comment, that if I had been at a conference here, let's say two years ago, the question would have been, oh dear, Hong Kong is not creative, what can we do about it? Now I sense it's Hong Kong is creative, and, and what should we do about it? There's a sense of, of enthusiasm and excitement, which I think was not here uh, in previous years. Yeah. You know, talking about you know this morning, you know, everyone literally all the talks you know talk about experience-based learning, you know, it's, um, emotions, how to inject you know something different, you know. And uh, talking about this learnability, I remember um, 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 Edmund, you know, you talk about this morning, um, the inquiry-based uh, learning communities, and I wonder, you know, it's, uh, because. Certainly, you know, we, we as um, 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 a CEO of the organizations, by the time we recruit people into the company, and it's probably a bit too late, you know, if their mindset is already rigid or whatever. So it's got to be something start young and, and, and happens you know, during the uh, universities as well. And perhaps, you know, from the education perspective, how adaptive is the education system, you know, change to improve that learnability? Perhaps, you know, it's, um, um, you know, one uh, from the local and one from the UK. Well, well f first of all, I'm 100% behind putting the focus on learning. I think, uh, to me, that really is the only way to go. And when you, when, you, when you talk about learning, it actually goes all the way from an individual learner to a group learning together, i.e. the concept of learning organization. And then when a group size gets sufficiently large, then it becomes a learning society. And that conversation has been going on for a long time. But the reality is people don't learn well, either as an individu individual or as an organization or as a society. So, so even though I, I'm complete with it, you there in, in, in saying that, that the focus has to be on, on self-regulated learning, which automatically brings in the ability to reflect, to adapt, and all that. Now, the reason that people don't learn well, well, there are many reasons, but, but the impression I got from listening to the, the talks and the discussion today is I guess for Hong Kong or any other society for that matter to really go forward in becoming a learning society, I, I think one condition or one precondition is we must have a common language upon which we can communicate as a community. You know, this morning I talked about the idea of a learning community and the idea of bringing people together to solve problems in a collaborative, inquiring way. And, and you mentioned the, the, the difficulty of diversity because, you know, with, with a more diverse group of people, the solution usually takes longer, but usually it's a better solution and all that. And it just doesn't happen automatically because, because despite our having been educated for a long time, we actually don't learn very well. Now, so my final point really is is to get that common language together so that when we talk as a community or as a society, that, that we, need to, we need to be very clear about what certain words mean. And I think a lot of the time, diver one, one problem with di diversity is, is when you have a different background that you actually process all external stimuli with your own lenses. And different words, different body languages, different you know, whatever will be interpreted differently. And I just want to bring back to our focus today. I actually picked up that today we did not distinguish creativity and innovation. And I, I heard the two words used interchangeably, 
And in just this plenary section, in fact, I thought you was reminding us that innovation is, is the key. Yeah, you skip it, but, but I pick it up in one of your slides. And, and, and your, con your emphasis on, on values and on survival and on marketability is, is one thing to generate lots and lots of ideas, even in the creative industry, right? I mean, you can make lots and lots of movies, but, but which of the movie changed the way the field practices? That's innovation. Very, very rare. Yeah, yeah. At the end, exactly. At the end of the day, you have to turn ideas into implementable ones. Some of which would change the way the field is practiced. Now, that to me is innovation. So I, I as an, uh, pardon me, you know, my background is in engineering. I'm not sure I want to teach creative engineers, but I want to teach innovative engineers. So, so I, I, first of all, I enjoy the talk because to an engineer, the sun is in our blood. And in fact, we teach to our first year students process and product design. But I'm sure you people out there would think that engineering is a very non-creative business. Right? So, so again, I guess, I guess I hope that today we at least get together and listen to each other. And from this learning, I hope that we at least go back with a common language as the basis of future conversation. And that's my wish. Okay. Uh, Professor Crosser, you know, perhaps you know, from, from your perspective, you, know, we, you, you mentioned a few points including you know, education perhaps you know, uh, uh, um, um, so even address or achieve real progress on employability you know, of students. And, um, but, but the reality is um, the university is a major institution, okay? And um, there are certain, um, I won't say rigidity, but there are certain system and, and, and in place. But what other, maybe, you know, other organizations can play a different role to augment, you know, the, the, the uh, university educations? Because you even talk about CPD, continuous professional de development after graduation as well. So I try to get into maybe the role of universities and even other institutions, other professional societies' role, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I think you're you're, you're absolutely right that that, that universities, um, um, including all those universities who build into their commitment a desire to create different kinds of learning experiences. Um, and to produce graduates who have a creative impulse. And I'd like to come back in a moment to some of those, the, those points that you were making, Edmund. Um, that, those, that the university itself is a structure, it's a structured organization. Um, that is often seen by outsiders as something that is limiting to a university. I think universities often, in the past and often in the present, can be over-structured, take long time to make some decisions, um, not flexible enough across their internal barriers between disciplines and between different parts of the organization. All that is true. Um, that can happen. I, I, one point I would make, which I always make, um, well, two points I'd make uh, about that notion of institutional rigidity of universities, before I answer your actual question, Edmund, is, is first of all, um, those of us who have tried to work with large corporates, know just how impossible it is often to work with them as well. That their internal rigidities, their internal divisions, their inability to work across divisions seems to me just as bad and often worse than universities. So let, you know, one shouldn't somehow stereotype um, universities um, as inherently conservative and rigid. But I'd also say um, that um, the stability of universities is one of the benefits they bring to society. Um, and with that stability goes a certain rigidity. Universities, in general, um, have been around for a very long time. Individual institutions have been around for a long time, and they will be around for a long time in the future. They occupy a place in their city, in their urban economy, in their national economy, in the whole national society and learning framework. And they provide a stability which many other organizations do not have. That's not a defense of rigidity, but it does say that maybe if we want a really responsive, constantly changing, 
agile, always moving universities will lose some of the important things they bring to a society, which is the very stability of their existence. But overcoming that in the ways that you've asked about, I think that, um, and we're back actually into the area of the learning, um, the, the learning society and the learning nation, because I think that one of the things that universities have to do and are doing increasingly um, um, in, in many countries, which I know, um, is to actually build working relationships and engagement with other organizations in the society. Professional associations are easy ones to build relationships with, but they are often even more conservative and more traditional than universities. Much more interesting are the links that are built with business, um, and businesses are of very many different kinds. One of the kinds of business that can make a real impact on a university are the most agile kinds of businesses, and those are often the small businesses, um, the innovative businesses. Um, those kinds of connections, I think, can be very important. But so can, Im equally important, can be connections with cultural organizations. Because there, again, you get different demands, different expectations, and on both sides, an energetic engagement, which, if both sides are interested in it, it ceases to be both sides. It becomes a common endeavor. Um, and if you look at any organization that has not lived solely within its, bound, within its own borders for the last 10 to 15 years, you will find that it's very different from what it was 10 to 15 years ago. Right. Universities, businesses, cultural organizations. Um, so I think that is very important. But can I make a comment or two about the, about the, 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 the issue of the learning capacity of a people and the, 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 what John said and then what, what, what you said, Edmund, as well? I agree with you that um, as a layperson, I don't want a creative engineer any more than I want a creative brain surgeon. Um, I want somebody who is competent and who is innovative and they know the latest methods that work. I don't want somebody to build a bridge um, or to operate on me um, who is trying out some new fanciful creative ideas. Um, however, um, there are specific areas where that may be the case. Um, but on the whole, if we're talking about learning capacity, of a people. Um, I think this is what both of you are meaning, but I want to unpack the meaning a little more. It is not the capacity to have learned something. It is the capacity to continue to learn things. Um, and we are educating people, to go back to something I said in my presentation this morning, we are educating people who will in the future occupy jobs that haven't yet been invented. How can we do that? We can't do that by filling them simply with knowledge, though they need knowledge. Um, we do that by filling them with ideas, ideas that they will think about and reflect about and, and, and give a life to on their own. But above all, we do so by educating people so that in the years ahead, they can continue to learn. Um, and learn when they're totally outside the influence of the university or the learning uh, institution. And one, a, a related concept um, that I often use in the UK when talking about why research-based education is so important, exposing undergraduate students to research-based ideas, is the absorptive capacity of a society, which I think is quite similar. The absorptive capacity, the ability of a society or an economy or a range of institutions to absorb and use new ideas. Now, if you don't get that in your, in your formal learning experience, you won't be able to do it in the future. If you're exposed to research-based learning, you understand that ideas are fragile, they're changing, that what is today's innovation will actually turn out to be um, of little importance in the future because you're engaging with researchers who are challenging ideas and thinking about them. And I think that's what the educational process needs to be about. Um, and that leads me to one final point that I wanted to make arising out of much of what we've talked about today. One final point um, on the issue you raised, Edmund. Um, and that is that Part of this will happen if we have students in universities who are not only interested in their contribution to the economy, and not only interested in their future earnings. Of course they have to be interested in that. Um, um, but they need to be interested in the simple fun of ideas. Interested in culture, interested in art, interested in new scientific ideas, even if they're not scientists. Interested in challenging and thinking and arguing with other people with their friends and with others. Um, because that will make them not only better citizens in society, it'll actually make them better contributors to the economy. Because that's what we were saying all along. Don't start with the economic contribution. Start with creating the kind of people who will be much more exciting citizens and fellow citizens. They will also be much better contributors to the economy.
Okay. Yeah. Um, almost the same language can be found in the Higher Education Review report released by the UGC. So. I haven't read it. We we agree. So we agree. between creativity and innovation. I want to stand up for creativity. Um, if, if, um, if someone says to a film director, you're being innovative, that's almost an insult. If, if someone says to an actor or writer, you're being innovative, that's a bit of an insult. Um, in the same way as you say to a brain surgeon, if you're being creative, that's an insult. They, they are different processes. They're not the same. Um, and if, if people use them meaning the same thing, then I, then I would suggest they're not making the most of those two words. Um, creativity is about personal expression, it's subjective. Um, it has an aesthetic. Um, innovation is objective, replicatable. At some stage, innovation has gone through a committee, it's been approved. Um, if you put an act in front of a camera, um, there's no committee to approve it. He carries it by the, the weight of his performance as the actor. That's the creativity. And we can, we can use that expressive quality in creativity. It can feed into innovation. Of course it can. Innovation never feeds into creativity. Creativity feeds into innovation. They're different processes. Now you get a real panel going. No, 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 no disagreement whatsoever. I just want to say I'm not putting down creativity. All I'm trying to do is to say don't use the two words because they are not the same. So I agree. Okay, you're now going to get um, another word of agreement, but from a his, but but from a, but from a historian, um, and that is I think that if you think back, if one looks back historically to how this language evolved, the distinction was not between creativity and innovation. It was between invention and innovation. That was the distinction that was made historically over the last 50 years in analyzing the way economies have changed technologically in the past. And the argument that was put was, it's not about inventions, because 99% of all inventions are completely useless. Um, it's innovation that matters. It's those inventions which become applied and used. And then the word invention has been dropped and replaced by the word creativity, which is something very, very different. Creativity is not about coming up with a great idea suddenly um, and seeing if you can make it. It's actually about a process, the kind of things John's been talking about. And so it gets even more complicated because I agree entirely, creativity, we need to fight for creativity and not assume um, that what matters is just innovation. The purpose of the panel is to create uh, interactions and, and constructive debates and it seems definite that we're moving in that direction. Now, yeah, yeah. Now, now, <coughs> Right, okay. It did not seem that way to you. <laughs> okay. Now, I want to, to, to come to uh, um, um, the, the last point that you, you mentioned about um, preparing you know, st uh, students you know, during their university life, you know, a bit of more research dimension. Now, um, um, John, you know, I remembered you um, saying something previously and um, even um, encouraging designers you know, to, at, um, to acquire you know, the research you know, uh, skills. Now, is that something, you know, to, um, 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 that strike covalence to you during your experience and uh, um, um, training them, educating them, that this is something that is crucial, you know, for, for them, you know, to deal with the challenges ahead? I think it is. I think that a capacity to understand the various levels of research and to be competent in one or more of them is really becoming vitally important. Um, in that case study I showed you of King Long, the board of directors of the company were fed research reports by the consultant designers, which uh, enabled the directors to constantly monitor what was happening, be aware, give comment, and usually they gave approval. And research was used, in fact, as a very important tool shaping the direction of the whole project and getting everybody involved on board. But to get back to the general level on which you put the question, Edmund, I think there's probably three broad areas of research that, that are valuable in design. Uh, the first is what I would call research in practice. 
These days, design is getting away from doing little bits of furniture and vases and glassware and all that sort of stuff. It's getting into realms of complex systems requiring more than one design discipline interacting with a number of other disciplines. Very quick example, I've got a friend in Tokyo who runs a design consultancy that's doing work for all Nippon Airways. They're designing the interiors of A&A &A aircraft, not the glassware, not the seats, not the decoration of the interior. They're doing the whole process of interaction between customers from the point of w at which they log on to the company's website through to when they arrive at their eventual destination. And it's a very highly complex affair that requires a lot of organization and a lot of research capability. So this design in practice requires people checking up on all sorts of areas that are vague and need clarification. At the other extreme, you've got the broad areas that are probably appropriate for PhD level research, the big broad topics of the field. Uh, and in the middle, uh, there's a, an area that, that, that uh, is variously named, but reflective research is as good a name as any. It's where people reflect upon a range of practice, not the individual problems that occur in practice, but the range of techniques and approaches that are used in practice and are then uh, considered, improved, and fed back into the system for implementation. There's a cyclic approach to this reflective design that's, that's needed as a constant means of refinement and, and evaluation. The, the panel is taking over, why not? <laughs> you won't be needed soon, Evelyn. Um, I want to add something to that. I mean, I wouldn't for a moment begin to question your typology there, um, John, because, you know, you, you are a design specialist. I just want to add something from my own experience. Um, in my um, last role, I was, I was head of a, a university goldsmiths, um, which has um, a reputation for very innovative, innovative um, work in, 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 in design, in, 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 in art, and so on. Um, and Intel um, used to come over from California every year and put money into the Goldsmiths Design and Sociology Departments to do work that was entirely fanciful. They wanted to get consumers, users, to be um, playing with new technologies, technologies that no one had ever dreamed of before that had come out of the design department, and they wanted to get ethnographic research done on that in order to see what users made of something which they at Intel could not think of the use for. Um, and it was, um, that one of the things they did um, was there was a month-long project of getting people to cycle around London with mobile communication instruments and communicating with each other in order to understand how people configured their conception of time and, and place um, when they were in movement with, 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 with mobile technologies. Because they knew that what people, how people experienced time and how they experienced place was going to be different. They needed ethnographic research to get them to understand it, because actually what they knew, and that you were referring to this quite a lot in your talk, John, is that actually it is users who are often involved in making the designed object something real, and it isn't what the designers necessarily thought it was going to be. And that's a new world we've entered into, isn't it, um, in recent years? Um, not only that, designers are moving away from the design of actual forms. Remember what I said about the LG uh, statement. Uh, there's a process in which designers are becoming not form givers, I'm translating from the German there, form giver, the giver of form, to an enabler, designing systems that enable users to configure them in their own interests, in their own particular, to, in their own interests. And it's becoming crucially important that we understand these, that this move away from mass production is, is loaded with all sorts of possibilities, very creative possibilities too. Evan, you seem to have a point there. Uh, not a point, but just a story to share. Because John told us that he went to Korea and visited the top designers in Samsung and LG. Actually, two weeks ago, I also went to Korea. But of course, with a bunch of uh, boring, unimaginative engineers. Uh, be that as it may, it turned out that uh, one of the keynote speakers uh, was the president of KIAT, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, Korea Institute for the Advancement of Technology. The whole talk is about 
how to make engineering more art oriented. And in fact, if you look at Kiev's slogan right now, is technology is art. So, so I guess both sides are beginning to see what they have been missing, the other side that they need to pay more attention to. Now, um, Hong Kong is a very democratic society, and I will try to be as democratic as I possibly can. Now, the time is, um, is, is, um, is an issue here, but with this um, class of panel here, um, could we have another five, ten minutes, you know, to, so that we can conclude that without rushing that? Okay, thank you, thank you. Now, <laughs> you didn't ask us, okay. <laughs> All right, okay, thank you. Now, um, um, I want you know, to, to, to come back because it's very difficult you know, to have a good uh, conclusion because I think a lot of comments that at least I heard of today is a, is a fantastic program. I think really grateful you know, to the um, three organizers to put this together, um, first of all. And secondly, I think you know, this is a very important topic uh, and directions. And even just half day session this morning can easily expand into a whole day plus another half day or, 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 or one day workshop. Now, um, I, I, I suddenly, with all these exchanges, you know, I recall um, the three T's you know, uh, coming from uh, uh, John you know, originally. When you talk about you know, the creative economy, you focus on the three T's, you know, the talent, technology, and tolerance. Okay? And while you guys are talking, exchanging views, and I come across the fourth one, which is from McKinsey Consultants. Because um, they're, they're talking about in the creative um, um, era, you know, the T personality is actually very crucial for individuals and organizations. The T, you know, the, the vertical stroke actually represents the core competence. Okay, we are trained in a particular field or fields, but the horizontal one, it seems to be the topic that we're talking about this day, uh, today, which is cross-discipline, cross-profession. Okay, you know, a technology is art or, or inspired by art. You know, it's, um, it seems that you know, we really need to draw on the right brain power you know, these days in what we do. So, so I guess you know, it's um, the take home messages you know, for all of you because uh, I use the term creative leak only broadly because I, I personally I, I could not find a, a word to, to, to name the group of people uh, for the future. So I hope that you know, um, all of us here could could really you know, um, try to learn as much as we possibly can from each of the speakers you know, today. And, um, and even engineers, you know, we have uh, a few of them you know, uh, 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 in the conference. Don't just get trained uh, or, or, or feel that you are trained as an engineer and then you can get CPD in engineers. Try to get exposed to other fields. Okay? As uh, um, Professor just said, that, you know, we really need you know, to have acquired interest in art culture and, and, and many other topics. Now, the reason I put together you know, the, the presentation this morning, if you were here you know, to, to, to listen to that, I tried to, to uh, um, portray you know, the landscape you know, to, to all of you here, because I don't know whether we are ready for the creative economy or not, but I only know that for the learning experience, all these institutes happen um, to have very unusual architecture you know, these days. So urban setting wise, you know, um, um, we are not deficient in, in, in that kind of aspect. But at the same time, we need to work on the education curriculum because uh, uh, we need to be prepared for the challenges. Okay? And then at the same time, there's a lot of issues. I think um, um, Professor Cross you know, put it very well. Knowledge management is a major initiative, uh, perhaps in the UK, but also in Hong Kong. Okay? And the RGC has put together the, the, the the major investment and commitment you know, to improve on the knowledge transfer. I think you, you talk about the universities these days you know, could um, 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 strike more collaboration with business, with um, um, cultural organizations, and perhaps you know, to, um, um, give students more opportunity to involve in projects to develop their, their, their lateral thinking and skills and so on and so forth. But um, at the same time, and um, um, from, from, from um, Edmund, you know, talk about this uh, learning, you know, to, um, um, community things. Be able to learn, and also, you know, from John, be able to learn is a very important um, aspect, okay? And even you know, at Design Center, I tell you the truth, we run a lot of education-type knowledge exchange program. We differentiate from what we do to the universities, okay? But in Hong Kong, we need, you know, everyone to pick up that curiosity, okay? And we even offer all these courses almost like free of charge sometimes. 
and then we are, we, are, we are still trying to stimulate you know, the interest. I think, I think the learning must be both sides. That, that, that's my message. Okay. Now, the, the, the last bit of word you know, to uh, Professor John Haskett, because um, uh, John, to me, I, I know him you know, for a couple of years now. And um, he has a sterling record overseas, and he's been working at PolyU for quite some time, almost like a decade now. All right? And he has retired. He has relocated back to the UK, and now get back you know, to Hong Kong and be the acting dean uh, at the School of Design, PolyU. I think Hong Kong, to a large extent, is blessed to have the caliber like John to be here, an expert in design management, expert in design thinking. We're not, we not saying design thinking will save the world here, but it's one, definitely, one tenet, or one framework that can help stimulate uh, uh, more value creations, ideas, and, 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 and activities there. So I, I would say that you know, to all, all, all our friends you know, from overseas, and um, thank you very much you know, for coming afar to here. And, um, um, but you know, these sort of programs, and I'm telling you, um, Bohemia is a fantastic, it's a think tank. Okay? We've got you know, the chairman, we've got you know, the board directors are winning here you know, all day, and then we've got you know, the government uh, participation at a pretty high level you know, today. And it, it, it states out a lot you know, the, the commitment uh, uh, um, of the government towards you know the uh, creativity, and I'm sure that you know this value can um, um, help uh, 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 build a better uh, Hong Kong, you know, uh, um, to work, live, and work together. Okay. Now, um, um, to draw the close now, and um, I really like you know to have big hands from all of you, you know, to this uh, uh, panel. I think it's, it's not easy, you know, to come by, and. Um, 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 <coughs> Yeah, I would say you know, big hands you know, to um, all our our panels you know, for uh, uh, today. Thank you very much. Can I just add a word on behalf of the, the of those of us who, who who've come from outside Hong Kong to this event? Simply to say, that I found it enormously stimulating. It has been a very tiring day because there has so much been packed into it, but it's been worth it because I think the sessions have been tremendous and, and uh, it is one of the best events of its kind I've attended. So, many thanks to the British Council. Um, to the Bahinia Foundation and to um, Hong Kong Youth Space for organising such a very good event that was certainly worth travelling to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, my last, my last remarks to all of you. You know, um, all of you, you know, y if you really have that interest and says to know to, um, um, to boost up yourself, to up your, 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 your level of knowledge and skills, at PolyU, at DI, at Design Centre, you know, we, we run a lot of programmes and even British Council, you know, run a lot of, you know, programmes you know, related to art, culture, and design, okay? And we only enlist the top class speakers or workshop leaders in all our workshops with no exception, okay? Now, we can do whatever we can, but we need, you know, to see more feedback and more interest, you know, from you. So do spread the words and join all these organizations as friends and stay, you know, to keep in touch with all the activities and hope that in the future we run all these programs again, then we'll see you and many more of you here. Thank you very much.